welcome once again to EW10's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host, our special guest and author. Coming to us from New York City is Father George W. Rutler. He's the rector of St. Michael's Church in the heart of New York City. The book is Grace and Truth, 20 Steps to Embracing Virtue and Saving Civilization. Welcome, uh, Father Rutler. Great to see you once again, as always. Thank you. Very good. Glad so, we have this chance to talk. Yes, it's always great to see you. It's always a great reaction we have to our audience when you're featured on one of our programs. You were on with Raymond Arroyo talking about this book in the past as well. And Grace and Truth is kind of an interesting book. We're proudly publishing it here at EWTN because it's actually based on a, a series you did in the past, correct? Trying to uh, remember exactly over what lines. I think it was about uh, two series. Mm -hmm. Um, um, you have to remember, I, I have been doing series with CWTN now. I think this is, would be my 32nd year. Wow. So uh, sometimes it's hard to, uh, right. <laughs> to remember them or to keep them, to keep them separate. I noticed there at the very beginning you said, when it was suggested that the following television talks might be published as a book, I might have demurred if I had put them together myself. What did you mean? Well, first of all, um, what the, the spoken word is different from the written word. And when uh, uh, what is given orally is then uh, transcribed, mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 it can sound a little more colloquial than a writer would intend. So I had that reservation there. And I'm glad I didn't have to do the transcribing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it came out readable. Right. Uh, readable. The, the other consideration, of course, is that um, uh, the the it's like an artist or a writer. He's not always the best judge of his own work, mm -hmm. and so uh, it was very good advice once to an author to when he had written something to uh, erase his little darlings. That is his favorite quotations in that. Um, because uh, it could be rather self-conscious, and, and the author or the, whoever the artist is is not always the best judge of his own uh, work. On the other hand, uh, the Holy Spirit works mm. through mm, both the spoken word mm. and the written word, and if you speak to thousands and thousands of people, mm -hmm. as one does on, on EWTN, maybe millions, you could say, right. uh, you, you get a lot of di a different uh, interpretations. Uh, it's filtered through the experience of, uh, of, the, uh, of the listener. Mm -hmm. I remember once there was a... a, a mm. Yeah, I was going to ask you just at one time, because you mentioned this as a conversation. So when you did these series, did you script out or write out the talks, or were these things that you di did extemporaneously? How did you do it so it was a conversational kind uh, of approach? Yeah, I had, a, I had some, well, I had mental notes. Mm -hmm. But those series I, I, I did without any script. OK. Um, and I used to do that as well on Good Friday. Mm -hmm. now, I. Th I think I preached the three hours devotions on Good Friday almost for, uh, 40 times. Mm -hmm. I did it again this year. And I've um, I made a practice of knowing what I was going to say, mm -hmm. thinking I knew, but then uh, not using uh, notes. Sometimes you find yourself saying things that you hadn't <laughs> anticipated saying, but uh, no notes. So I, I remember. Uh, a lady once said to me that she thought God had given me a special gift to be able to uh, preach for three hours without a, a single thought. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. I, Madam Malaprop meant, <laughs> meant well anyway. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. So I, I hope there are a lot of thoughts in the, uh, this book. There you go, that's right. Uh, <laughs> the rivals, right. Uh, it's interesting, too, you mentioned that I, uh, from being from New York and being familiar with Devis Susskind, so in 76 was the first time you were on television. Why would, how did you end up being on the David Susskind show? 
Well, that's a good question. I mean, I mean, you could also ask, how did I end, uh, end up with Mother Angelica? Right. Uh, I didn't ask. I, I was asked. Mm -hmm. uh, with David Susskind, I believe the issue of the day was just beginning, uh, the controversy of the day was uh, ordination of women. Mm -hmm. And I had written a, a small book, in fact, it was the first book I ever wrote on that subject. And I have to say, what I predicted has mm -hmm. really come to pass, uh, uh, the consequences of that. So I think that's how I got mm -hmm. on. And I remember that program very well because it was recorded back to back with um, a group of representatives of a lobbying organization for um, uh, short people, or midgets, okay. the little people of America. Mm -hmm. And they hadn't told me this. And they came into the uh, makeup room, and I, I felt like the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> as, a, as a matter of fact, one or two of them had been uh, in that film. Uh, but so that was the first time I ever did, I think, anything on, mm -hmm. uh, on television. Right. Although I have to say mm -hmm. that there's something maybe in the genes. My mother was a great beauty, mm -hmm. and um, she was at the 1939 World's Fair in a, in a group watching a, uh, a display of the television. The people had never seen television. Right, right, right. And they asked her to come out of the audience and g go on camera so that people could see how television worked. And I remember my mother saying that people were asking, how do you pronounce this, television or television? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a, that's a, uh, that's quite a bit so of so. In that uh, way, your mother was an, actually an early star of television. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. Indeed. Well, let me ask you, Father. Uh, what's what's the connection in your mind? Speaking about the invention of television and your mother's involvement, how does that how does TV relate to speaking from a boat in Galilee? What's the connection? Our Lord. Uh, mm, spoke on occasions from a boat, specifically uh, St. Peter's boat, and everything our Lord did uh, was uh, calculated in the best way. And when we look back, we, we could just spend years and years trying to uh, examine the full meaning of what he did. But I think it's very telling that he spoke from the boat of St. Peter. We, sp we refer to the church as the bark of right, right. Peter. But our Lord wanted very much uh, to be visible and audible. Mm -hmm. And before there were microphones, uh, there was a, he used the acoustic properties of, mm -hmm. of the water, which, re which uh, reverberated the, the sound of his voice. Our Lord took the form of a slave and dwelt among us, the scripture says. And one of the limitations mm -hmm. in the physical order he took on was his own obedience to uh, physics, the very laws of nature that he had created. And of course, one of them was uh, sound. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, th I think that is ve it's very significant that he did that. And of course, by being pushed off a few yards from the shore, the crowd could see him better as well. Right. Let me ask you, had you, before you came to E.W. Chan and your first time you met Mother Angelica, had you ever seen her on TV at all? Was Did you have an impression before you actually met her for the first time? I think I had, I, I don't think I had seen her. Mm. Um, I, I don't own a television oh. and I think I had access to one back then, mm -hmm. but uh, certainly not the cable. But I had read mm -hmm. uh, about EWTN and the mm -hmm. phenomenon of this uh, group of uh, religious sisters uh, starting this mm -hmm. with just a few dollars. And that fascinated me uh, very much. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I, when I met her for the first time, it was as though I had al already known her. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting, too, in the, in the section, jumping into the book, The Golden Mean, 
you, you say here that we live in a generation that seeks to be dazzled rather than enlightened, amused rather than inspired, entertained rather than challenged and converted. The golden mean, as distinct from mediocrity, chooses the good over the convenient, the true over the plausible. What is the golden mean? The golden mean is the balance of, uh, between, between extreme versions of the truth. In other words, it really is uh, the truth. It's not a compromise. Um, uh, the great Cardinal Newman, who ha happily now is going to be canonized, uh, wrote a book on the Via Media, it, uh, but he was still a, uh, an Anglican, and it was the advertisement, the boast of the Church of England in his day, that they followed the Via Media, which was uh, the narrow road between extremes. There was a famous 17th century uh, Anglican divine who wonderfully said that the Church of England uh, tread the middle way between uh, the slovenliness of the conventicles, mm -hmm. meaning the uh, evangelicals, mm -hmm. and the gaudy meretriciousness of Rome. <laughs> so it's very mm -hmm. clear that he had a decided views on both Protestantism and Catholicism, and he thought that by following that middle road, he he was avoiding the worst of extremes and and adopting the best. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the classical idiom, the the via media is that uh, the truth, the mm -hmm. balance. And Newman and also Chesterton uses the image uh, of a charioteer who has to lean a little to the left, a little mm -hmm. to the right in order to keep his balance, but he never tumbles over. Uh, uh, the Greeks talked about the golden mean, and the great Roman uh, poet Horace, um, in one of his lines, mm -hmm. talked about uh, aureum quis quis uh, mediocritatem diligit. Uh, blessed is the man who, who follows the, the middle road. But that middle road is not mediocrity. Mm -hmm. And I think our culture today it's l largely has lost a sense of mm -hmm. objective truth. So mm -hmm. they think that if you compromise a little bit here, a little bit there, you'll, you'll uh, pacify uh, everybody. But that's not the truth. That's just in the homogenation of the uh, mm -hmm. uh, people's um, opinions. Our Lord says that we have to be perfect, as our Heavenly Father is perfect. He says, no one is good, save my Father in heaven. Well, how can you be perfect if you can't be good? Well, good is the essence of divinity, and we're not divine. But perfection is the goodness of God at work in us. If we give God permission, as Mother Teresa of Calcutta used to say, right. then he can uh, bring us uh, into his uh, 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 grace. Mm -hmm. And that's, that perfection is, is the challenge to, to mediocrity. Mm -hmm. uh, it involves, of course, uh, a risk. One has to sacrifice one's own prejudices mm -hmm. and, and yield to the truth of God. Well, you make the point. And that's why a lot of people, when our Lord. Right, you make you know, the When our, our Lord walked among the crowds, a lot of them were not w willing to change their opinions. Mm -hmm. Well, you make the point that Christ was crucified by, uh, by mediocrities. Yes. Um, he said, my words are truth. He doesn't, say I, he doesn't say that I'm going to tell you true things. Uh, teachers do that. Philosophers do that. And, of course, he was understood by most people as a teacher, as a rabbi, and he was. But instead of saying that I'll tell you truths, he said, I, I am the truth. And that, he uses the image of walking with him because I am the way and the truth and the life. So the only way to really embrace the truth is to walk with uh, the Lord. It's not a mere uh, mental mm -hmm. activity. And uh, mediocrity will not... Uh, go with our Lord. Our, our Lord's very clear that he is the way and the truth and the life. There's no right. uh, option. 
Right. This is, I thought, was really important, and I think, uh, you know, is especially true today. You say a mediocre civilization loses a sense of evil, specifically how evil came into the world. That is, it rejects original sin. But once you reject the idea of original sin, all you do is open the gates to it on all its cultural manifestations. A bland, naive, secular humanitarianism is not Christianity. The un underestimation of the power of evil is uh, a, a seduction of, of Satan. I mean, how many times has it been said that the uh, uh, worst, uh, worst evil is to deny the existence of evil? And we see the consequences today. Uh, but we cannot deny reality. A evil is, is real. I mean, I can write down, write down the street from where I'm speaking is you know, the, the uh, Empire State Building. I can deny the law of gravity, but if I jump mm -hmm. off the Empire State Building, the, very soon the pavement reminds me that uh, the law of gravity is, is real. So we have now uh, um, a contradiction, mm -hmm. but it's an understandable one, in which we live in a society which denies uh, evil and yet is frightened by it at the same time. Uh, the consequence is that people seek their own happiness and they find that it, it's a seduction from the evil one and therefore they're disappointed. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the last, what, in the last um, uh, 10 years, we've had a 70% increase in teenage suicide. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Uh, uh, for the first time uh, in the history of our country, um, the life expectancy rate mm -hmm. across the board has declined in the last two years. And much of that is because of suicide, uh, also mm, because of uh, drug poisoning. Mm -hmm. well, why do people have recourse to these uh, false uh, s uh, s uh, su substitutes for happiness? Mm -hmm. e e even, even the suicide thinks that that's going to bring them happiness in a perverse way. But why is that? Because of the denial of evil. Uh, and the, 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 de the devil is the prince of mm -hmm. lies. Anything he tells us is mm -hmm. not true. That's the via negativa. If we want to know the truth, well, we can consult the devil, and what he tells us is an indication of what is truth. But mm. the shortcut and the, the straight path is, is the truth of our Lord. Right. Now, in the chapter, Innocent Blood, you say, whenever the dignity of the human person founded in the redemptive power of Christ is ignored, the selfish pride of man will find some excuse to attack innocence. Innocence, uh, innocence is a threat. Mm -hmm. um, innocence is not naivete. Right. Uh, naivete is being unaware of reality. So you could say that the denial of uh, evil is the ultimate uh, naivete. But innocence is um, uh, pure uh, access to the goodness that God offers us. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when our Lord said you have to be like children to enter the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't say to be... Uh, uh, childish. Mm -hmm. Children cannot be childish. Only grown-ups can be childish. Children are children. Mm -hmm. uh, but our Lord is telling us that we have to share that innocence of the child, the openness um, to unfamiliar truths. The child is filled with wonder because everything is new to that, uh, that child. Uh, the uh, threat to that innocence is cynicism. Or when 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 they, we doubt that there is a, a truth, our Lord is the truth. He stands in front of Pontius Pilate, mm -hmm. and Pontius Pilate probably was formally educated in the philosophical school uh, of the Cynics. He certainly was influenced by it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, when Pilate says to our Lord, "What is truth?" Uh, he's not just expressing exasperation; he's asking a question that he had been taught from, I'm sure, from, from boyhood in the Philosophical Academy. But because he was a cynic, he didn't think there could be 
an answer. And that's, and that's why, that's why he walked away on uh, the one man in all history who could have answered his question. Mm -hmm. Well, you talk about the idea that there's a kind of schizophrenia, schizophrenia that the world buys into when it has lost its reverence for innocence. The very so-called civilized people who speak about legalizing the shedding of innocent blood will speak of child welfare. It, well, the experience of the, of, uh, the modern holocausts should have taught us the depths of, of evil. There was a, a, a German theologian who said that Hitler should have been given a, an honorary theological uh, doctorate uh, for having proven that the devil is real. Mm -hmm. And yet, we, don't, we haven't learned that much uh, from the experience of those wars of the 20th century. Uh, in the state of New York now, and of course it's becoming a contagion, mm -hmm. it's now legal t uh, t uh, to kill babies w w when they're coming into the world. Mm -hmm. uh, this, is the, uh, this is the ultimate conclusion, uh, result, of the, of the uh, horror of, of abortion. Mm -hmm. And what happened? When that law was passed and it was signed, the governor signed it, um, the people applauded. Th that is uh, perverse that is um, diabolic. Mm -hmm. uh, and here again, we see it work, uh, evil be my good. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think maybe just 40, 50 years ago, if you had told people that we would have had this kind of legislation now, they would have said it, it, uh, it was uh, impossible. Uh, but we see, it, we, we, see the, we see the results right now. Mm -hmm. Our Lord w w most mercifully did not, when he rose from the dead, didn't go around telling people, I told you so. <laughs> that would have humiliated right, them. Right, right. Yeah, he humbled them. To mm -hmm. humiliate is to shame. If you humiliate a child, a child can be psychologically uh, crippled. Mm -hmm. But to humble someone is to show them the truth, uh, not in a destructive way, right. but in a constructive way. Uh, alliance with that truth, letting right. people know what is what is real. In your and that's why uh, when, when Thomas doubted the resurrection, our Lord didn't uh, uh, embarrass him. Mm -hmm. He just empowered him by, by showing him his wounds because he had an assignment for right. Thomas, and Thomas did realize that with his shedding of his own blood. Now, in the uh, chapter, The Propensity to Do Evil, you say, evil always calls itself good. Every vice parades itself as a form of liberation, which is really what I think we probably see more so today than ever before. Who was Father Theobald Matthew? Oh, he was an extraordinary character, um, a priest uh, in, in uh, Ireland who started the uh, temperance movement, mm -hmm. uh, not like Carrie Nation was one of those fanatics, uh, but uh, uh, alcohol abuse in his day was like uh, the opioid crisis today. Mm -hmm. And he, he had a m thousands and thousands of Irish take the so-called pledge. He did that in Scotland too, which was close to a, a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> And then he came to the United States, and uh, I think it was President Polk mm -hmm. had him uh, at the White House, one of the first Catholic priests uh, to uh, speak in the White House. Uh, I think he's a, he's a neglected figure, and I think more should be written, uh, written about him. Right, exactly. I think he met with Zachary Taylor and ultimately Millard Fillmore at the same time. So. It's interesting you bring him up uh, as somebody who's, who stood up and tried to do the right thing. The other thing I thought was interesting is how did you, how are man or mankind like seals or like seals in the Galapagos Islands? Well, in the, we, we haven't, we live in a protected environment. That is, uh, we have our basic physical needs, and yet we don't. Um, we're not a real. We're not aware 
uh, unless we're inspired by revelation, mm -hmm. uh, of different dimensions beyond what we, what we see uh, and what we sense. And though I'm the seals on the Galapagos Island, uh, as I said, we're in a controlled environment. But uh, when they were exposed to uh, people, they didn't know what to do. Uh, they didn't run away or whatever, mm -hmm. swim away. Mm -hmm. uh, they just didn't know what, uh, what this was. Right. I suppose in a sense, this is what the scripture means when it says that we entertain angels unawares. Very often, right. our Lord sends messengers to us, angelic messengers, uh, and we don't know how to deal with them. In fact, we don't recognize them as such because we expect angels to look like our concept of angels, mm -hmm. and they don't. Right. Um, uh, and the only one who really was able to deal with an angel uh, without perplexity, although she asked how could this be, was uh, the, uh, the mother of our, our Lord. Our Lady, right. Um, so I think that, I use that image of the seals right. Right. Uh, to make that point. Right. Well, let me ask you, Father, because we're just about out of time. Do you have any other books you're working on? I know you put something out on a regular basis on the web, but I was wondering if you had any books in the works. Well, um, I know there's a book. Somebody, someone is writing a book about things I've said, quotations. Mm -hmm. So I, <laughs> I hope, okay. I, I hope it's uh, uh, readable. Uh, in the best sense, mm -hmm. um, I don't think I have any uh, uh, freedom to censor anything. Sometimes I'm a, I'm accused or credited with saying things I didn't say, like Yogi Berra. Right. Uh, Yogi Berra <laughs> said a lot of the things I said I, I, I didn't say, which w itself was Yogi Berraism. And what I would like to do as well, right. to write a book, uh, if I have the chance, on my experiences as a priest uh, in New York. Right. Well, that would be quite interesting, and especially if you're talking about original sin running wild in the streets in front of you. Thank you so much, Father George Rutler. Always great to see you, and uh, good luck, and God bless your work in your parish in New York City. The book has been Grace and Truth, 20 Steps to Embracing Thank Virtue you. and Saving Civilization, proudly published by EWTN Publishing, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com. Check this book out. Check us out next time right here on Bookmark. Thank you for joining us for this special edition.